Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here today for the Addressing Security in Media Workflows session. My name is uh, Usman Shakil, and I'm an Enterprise Solutions Architect with Amazon Web Services. I work with many startups, many large enterprises in the media, enter uh, media entertainment uh, vertical, and I'm happy to be here and uh, address the security uh, or in media workflows. So since I'm a solutions architect, I work with many of you, many of the customers. Um, so let me put myself in your shoes here. And what is the first question that I'll ask if I was to put my media applications or workflows on the AWS cloud? Yes, you guessed it. Does AWS meet my security requirements? Yes, it does. But perhaps a better question to ask would be, what, we can, what can we do together, AWS and the customer as a team, to ensure that your media applications and workflows are secure? And that's really what we're going to be addressing here today. So to start with, security within AWS is a shared responsibility model. Everything from the dirt of the data center all the way up to the hypervisor layer, the virtualization layer, is AWS's responsibility. What that means is the facilities, the data center facilities, uh, the physical security of the facilities, infrastructure, uh, the uh, security of the network infrastructure, anything that is on the host, um, host uh, machines, if you will, the uh, security around that, network security, as I talked about, and the hypervisor security, any sort of vulnerabilities, patches, et cetera, everything is AWS's responsibility. What that means is anything that you put on that infrastructure now, any sort of applications, starting from the guest operating system all the way up to the application layer, that includes configuring your firewalls, uh, network configurations uh, within your applications, the OS level firewalls, account management, et cetera, all that becomes customer's responsibility. Now, AWS responsibility, the physical infrastructure security that I talked about, AWS actually goes through or has done already these different audits or compliances that are in place today. For example, the SAS 70 SOC 1 audit, ISO 27001 certification, P PCI DSS level 1 compliance, FedRAMP, GovCloud, and most recently, the MPA best practices compliance with the help of our partner code. Now, all these certifications are done by AWS and are managed on an ongoing basis. And there are thousands of customers that are actually running uh, applications that are SOX compliant, PCI compliant, HIPAA compliant, and ITAR compliant, and many other applications on us. So what I'm not gonna focus in this particular talk today is how does AWS manage the security of the physical infrastructure? Or what are the controls in place? Rather, what I'm really going to focus on is what are the tool set that AWS provides you to secure your applications. If you're really interested in knowing more about the security controls within the AWS um, responsibility area, I highly recommend you look into the AWS security white paper, uh, check out the security center that has security white paper and risk and compliance white paper document. And also here at reInvent, there are uh, a few different sessions. Actually, there's a security track um, we have one of our uh, security solutions architects, Max Ramsey, who's gonna be talking about security in the AWS cloud. Uh, Steve Schmidt, our CISO, is gonna be talking about security off the AWS cloud. And Jim Shar is gonna be talking about AWS identity and access management. So highly recommend uh, check those sessions out uh, if, you, uh, if you are interested in knowing more about the security controls there. So let's begin with a simplified media workflow. So, Assuming um, the infrastructure layer or the security of the infrastructure layer on AWS side is all great, complete, uh, what can we do 
on the application layer from this point onwards. So let's, let's take uh, you know, a very generalized or simplified media workflow here. We start with media ingest. There could be many different input streams um, you know, from many different outlets that we have to take, ingest into the AWS cloud. There is an ingest layer that is accepting the content, putting it into S3, say storage, or putting the uh, related, say, metadata or some sort of like, uh, uh, you know, a state, if you will, into the SQS service, if you're using it. Then we have a processing cluster, which is, say, processing the media, and then finally delivery out to the end user. So let's examine how each one of these steps in the media workflow um, can be, can we, how can, what are the different controls in place that AWS gives us to make sure that uh, you know, the security is there. Before we do that, let me talk about Motion Pictures Association of America content security best practices. So MPAA uh, provides content security best practices that range from management systems, physical security, and digital security. By the way, this slide is not for reading. You can look it up on their website. It's just for reference only that there are so many different controls that range from management systems to physical security to digital security. Now, Physical security, one can assume, yes, AWS is taking care of the physical security or, for the, or the security of the physical infrastructure should be taken care of. Management systems, there could be management around that physical infrastructure as well as management of your applications. And digital security is really how you're securing or how you're storing, processing, and then delivering your content. So recently, we worked with our partner, Code, um, to do a pretty comprehensive audit of the existing security controls that we had in place. Um, and what we found was, in all these different areas, um, AWS actually meets the MPAA best practices. Now you see a blue box there that is more like a not applicable. So this is where we uh, earlier talked about shared responsibility model, right? Where you as a customer have the capability to go do encryption, uh, you know, how you handle the actual content itself starting from encryption to OS level hardening, and we'll talk about more details in, uh, in, the, in the presentation here. Hence, these are not applicable to AWS. Awesome, great. So we talked about compliance, we talked about you know, shared responsibility. What does this really mean to you? How does this translate to you? So what this means is, is all the facilities, physical security, infrastructure, um, virtualization infrastructure, since AWS has uh, complete control over it, becomes our uh, responsibility. And since AWS has went through the audit with the help of code for MPA best practices, so you can think or you can take that that's already taken care of. What that means then is since you and only you have the uh, uh, you have the uh, access to the actual content that you're putting on the AWS infrastructure, starting from the guest operating system layer all the way to your application. It becomes your responsibility to make sure that it is secure and it meets the MPAA best practices guidance. Now that's where we need to talk about some cool AWS features, things like identity and access management, EC2 security features, VPC, uh, S3 security features, and CloudFront security to see how these different features really work in conjunction to give you the tool set to build that application that could be an MPA compliant application. So let's start with identity and access management. So identity and access management is uh, and I, I won't really dig deep into it because there is an identity and access management session and I recommend if you're interested, you go uh, and you know, listen to it in more detail. But I'll just touch base very quickly here. Uh, it is a service from AWS, um, a utility service, a free service actually, that gives you the capability to, to create users and groups and really give permissions to your, those users and groups or manage permissions for those users and groups to the underlying AWS resources. So say for example, you have uh, you know, a bunch of users that are your network 
admins. You want to give them the capability to be able to go in and work on your uh, network configurations or change your uh, uh, security groups, that is firewalls, etc. Other users that you want to give access only to say content read only, there will be others that uh, group that have access to say uh, writing or changing the content. So basically, the IAM feature set or service gives you really that capability that you can streamline what users or what group of users can actually have what type of access to your underlying AWS resources. It is really nicely integrated with uh, all different AWS services. So for example, S3 um, is nicely integrated with IAM. Um, one thing there to note there that is IAM is not meant to be uh, an operating system uh, is not meant to be for operating system or applications. So for that, you use you know whatever you use today, like LDAP or Active Directory or anything like that. So the first step in our journey that we have to take this you know valuable assets uh, to the cloud. Again, the workflow, the ingest workflow here, where it's it's really taking the um, your content and moving it into the cloud. So first thing I talk about here is the encryption or the client-side encryption. So let's talk about S3 client-side encryption. So AWS SDK for Java actually has a tool set that provides you the capability to encrypt the content before you actually send it into S3. So look for Amazon S3 encryption uh, client class um, in the AWS SDK. And the way it works is, is that as a user or as a customer, you are managing your own master key and then you use the AWS SDK for Java that has a key generator and it generates an envelope key. Your content files, all that stuff, you encrypt it, uh, encrypt all your files with using the envelope key and then you encrypt the envelope key with the master key that you manage. Now both the encrypted envelope key and the encrypted content then is stored in S3 and upon retrieval of the content, you can use the master key to decrypt the content. So that's really the S3 client-side encryption. In addition to that, oops, really any other encryption library should work with, uh, with your ingest or you know, if it's on the client side. So you could you know, have a encryption, li encryption library on your client before you send it over to S3 or to the cloud. The second thing uh, after encryption we can talk about is the AWS Direct Connect. So Direct Connect is again an other AWS service that gives you a private connectivity from your co-location facility or for, from for your corporate data center into the AWS VIA co-location facility. And it could be a one giggy or 10 giggy cross connect private line. So what that means is really at that point you have a private connectivity and a secure channel to really uh, transmit content over to the cloud. The uh, different AWS services, they all come with SSL endpoints, and specifically what I would like to mention here is that you can use SSL endpoints for your ingest layer. So you know, if you have an ingest application, use SSL for that. So um, you know, that in that way, it is secure. The third uh, service that I'll talk about is the AWS import and export service, which is really a way for you to ship the physical drives to us we take the drive and we put your content onto the AWS cloud for you. That could be putting the cloud into S3 or creating EBS volumes for you. So really depending on your use case, you can choose any of these options, but these options are there really to give you the uh, you know, an additional level of security that you can put in place, especially for the uh, ingest layer. Now let's take a look at how do you really secure your storage? So first of all, S3 security. So since S3 is gonna be your underlying storage subsystem for your contents, um, what are the different features that S3 brings to the table? First of all, S3 gives you bucket and object level permissions. Anytime I go, I create a bucket or an object on S3, by default, only I, the creator of that bucket or the object or the content has access to it. By default, no one else gets access to it unless I explicitly in the S3 bucket or object level permissions mention or give 
uh, access to someone else. I can also require only signed URLs or query string authentication on my S3 object. So since S3 has a um, web-based uh, access or you can access via the API, um, I can require that there is a signed URL access or a query string, as I mentioned. Uh, I can integrate it very nicely with IAM, um, which is basically just a way of me giving access to certain IAM users or IAM groups that I have created access to certain content. That could be read-only content or uh, you know, uh, write or, or change content. Um, there is a versioning feature within S3 as well that really gives me the capability, additional capability in terms of accidental deletion. So anytime if I delete an object from my S3 bucket and if I have versioning enabled, well, it will really delete um, that particular object, but the versions uh, still remain in S3. I can also enable MFA delete, which requires a multi-factor authentication before I uh, delete any object from S3 bucket. And then finally, I can enable detailed access logging on my bucket as to who has access to certain objects or uh, bucket level access. Now, S3 also gives you the capability to do server-side encryption at rest. So really from, a, uh, from your perspective, if you're using this feature, all you do is enable um, the encryption flag on the HTTP header. So when you send in your content via the, or the files via the S3 API, in the HTTP header, you are enabling the uh, encryption, uh, an encryption flag. Now, what happens next is S3 is actually managing a master key. And there is a key gener there is actually a uh, encrypting um, encryption application S3 server side encryption application that runs on S3 layer. It has again a key generator that generates an envelope key and it's encrypting your files before those are being stored. And then once the files are being stored, then the master key is used to encrypt the envelope key and store that envelope key inside of S3 as well. A point to note here is that both the encrypted key, the encrypted envelope key, and the content are stored separately for added security. Now, anytime you request the content back, the decryption happens the same way, where it uses the uh, S3 master key to decrypt the envelope key, decrypt your files, and return your files back to you. So a great nifty feature to use. So let's talk about how do you uh, secure your content in terms of your content processing. So we're going to be using virtual private cloud in that. I thought it would be useful that I give a very quick brief intro to virtual private cloud in case you uh, haven't used it or don't know much about it. So virtual private cloud really is a cloud uh, or your private cloud within the cloud. I know it kind of sounds funny, but that's really what it is. It's an isolated portion um, within the AWS cloud. Now, if you think of it in the, uh, if you look at it, the slide, basically all the different AWS services, starting from S3, Glacier, SQS, um, you know, EC2 API endpoints, that are all available on the AWS uh, cloud. Now, VPC really lets you carve out a small portion of that cloud, which is really private to you. So in this case, uh, so first of all, I'd like to mention that uh, the fact that you can define the CIDR blocks or the IP ranges on your VPC. So I start with say a 10.0.0.0 slash 16 VPC and inside of that VPC, I have full control over the network configuration, how the traffic is routed um, inside of the VPC, not just inside the VPC, but out of the VPC into the internet or into my corporate data center. So really the, it, it, it gives you four different scenarios on how you can use the VPC. First of all, just imagine if you have, uh, you know, just a public application that you're running, just like normal EC2, um, and you want to put it in VPC. So I create a public subnet, uh, as you can see, with a slash 24 in it, and inside the route table, I really route the traffic uh, via the internet gateway, which is a virtual interface into the internet, into the public internet. I do get full control uh, both on the ingress and egress filters. Um, and so uh, I, I control who can have access or send in packets to the, uh, to the public subnet. 
Now, the other scenario is where, say, I wanted to only have my instances or my uh, application talking to my uh, corporate data center where, say, I have my database or some other uh, tier of my application really running. So in that case, uh, again, I can create a private subnet, in this case, 10.0.1.0 24, and I can route it such that the only communication to this subnet is via the VPN gateway, which is over a VPN IPsec tunnel back to my physical router that lives in the corporate data center. The third scenario is where I have both private and public subnets, and I have a route table that I have configured that determine how the traffic from each one of the subnets or to the subnets is coming to. And then in a scenario where, the fourth scenario where say some of my instances do need to talk to public endpoints like S3 or other uh, internet uh, you know, services or endpoints or resources, I can create a NAT instance, which is really a network ad address translation um, instance that will basically pass the traffic from my private subnet via the NAT instance into the internet. So really, I have full control over how the routing between these two different subnets are happening. So four different scenarios as we talked about. Additional EC2 security controls, um, as I mentioned uh, very earlier in the talk, that EC2 guest operating system is completely uh, controlled by you. You have full access, you have full OS admin or root access um, uh, on that EC2 guest OS. Uh, AWS has no visibility on your uh, operating system or what type of application or data that you have on your instance. And you generate the key pairs that you store, you manage, and you have access to. And that is the only way for you to access an EC2 instance. Let's talk a little bit about security groups. What are security groups? So really, security groups are stateful filters, uh, virtual stateful filters, uh, on your EC2 instance. Each EC2 instance has a security group attached to it by default that you can either create beforehand and attach it to the EC2 instance at the time of instance launch, or if you don't mention one, then it will uh, create a default security group, uh, which is basically you have no access to the instance unless you explicitly say so. So let's take the example of, uh, say, if I'm spinning up a streaming, uh, uh, say, Adobe Media Server uh, on an EC2 instance, how would I um, create the security group for that? So uh, Adobe Media Server requires ports TCP port 80, TCP port 1111, TCP UDP 1935 open. So basically, I open it to public. In that way, my FMS uh, streaming server works fine because I'm allowing that uh, access. Now, I do need access, sort of like SSH, into the instance. Now, that could be a bastion host or you know, some other way, maybe my corporate IP range, that I could open port 22 access over SSH2. So in that way, if there is someone else that is trying or attempting to connect to the instance over a different port which is not open, they are rejected. Another key feature that the security groups also bring to the table is that uh, you can really tier your applications where you can have different tiers of access. So you say, for example, in a normal three-tier uh, web application, you have a web tier, you have an app tier, and you have a database tier. So you can really define a security group for each tier, and you can only give access from one tier to another. In other words, you, know, you don't have to like, open up that entire tier to the general public. And security groups really allow you to do that very quickly. So for secure content processing, re revisiting it, first thing was that we can just simply put security groups in place around our processing uh, nodes, and they talk to S3 and uh, SQS as needed. Um, or the other option is obviously we could use VPC, we can put them in a private subnet, and they can talk over the NAT instance via the internet gateway to all the public endpoints. There are additional things that you can do, things like OS level firewalls, IP tables, patch management. Now all that, since 
AWS has no visibility into the guest operating system that all falls under the customer responsibility column. A lot of customers ask me about file system encryption. So regardless of what type of uh, uh, backend storage system you're using with EC2, that be ephemerals or EBS, uh, elastic block store, pretty much any type of uh, file system encryption uh, should work. Um, so some of the common ones for Windows and Linux, I mentioned it here, and I see that some customers use that often. The last piece there is content delivery. So I want to make sure that you know, the content that I'm delivering is actually uh, secure. So again, the workflow here is that you know, my content is in S3, I secured S3, and then from there I have either some delivery nodes, that could be uh, my streaming nodes, uh, or I could you know, uh, deliver the content directly from S3 or via CloudFront. So let's talk about how we secure that. So for that, I would like to dig deep into CloudFront security. So first of all, CloudFront gives you the capability of private content. So private content feature basically only delivers your content to securely signed requests. You can specify in your CloudFront distribution configuration for HTTPS only requests and delivery. So what that means is that it will, if you say you have your CloudFront endpoint, it will only entertain HTTPS only requests. Um, now for S3, if you guys remember, I mentioned earlier in S3 security that once you create a bucket, it is owned by you and only you have access to the underlying bucket or the object. So if I'm using uh, S3 uh, with CloudFront, that raises a question that how does CloudFront get access to S3? So for that, uh, CloudFront has a feature called CloudFront uh, X, origin access identity. So within IAM, you can create a CloudFront origin access identity, and inside of your S3 permissions, you can give permission to CloudFront origin access identity only. So what that means then is only the CloudFront pops can have or request the content from S3, and that is the only time when S3 will uh, you know, uh, uh, send in or reply back with the content. Now, if anyone else, say even your users, somehow figured out or reverse engineered the URL directly to your S3 bucket, they will not have access to your S3 bucket because it's only access only to you or the CloudFront. In addition to that, uh, CloudFront also gives you the capability to do signed URL verification. So you can do policy-based URL verification. Uh, where it, is, it could be a time-based, where you put a timestamp on it and it has an expiration, and a uh, signature. So after some particular, you know, some period of time, it'll basically expire the URL. The other option is the custom policy where you can explicitly mention an IP range as to who you want to give access to a particular content as well. CloudFront also gives you the capability to do HTTPS only um, origin fetches. So what that means is when CloudFront is requesting the content in the case of a cache miss from S3, that transfer from S3 into CloudFront is over HTTPS only. And that also holds for custom origin. So in the case, say, I have my own, uh, say, uh, origin uh, servers in EC2 or even in my on-prem data, uh, data center, I can require or I can put the same requirement for origin fetches on both custom or S3. Um, CloudFront also gives you the capability for trusted signers where you can whitelist specific AWS accounts to be able to, uh, uh, to sign you the requests and you accept those requests only. So in the case of say B2B transfers, right, where you want to give access to only specific AWS customers. You can do so with trusted signers. And then finally, you can enable access logs on CloudFront as well. So what that means is you will have a bucket in S3 which is there to store all the access logs or all the activity that's happening on CloudFront. 
CloudFront, um, so this was really the HTTP uh, piece, how you know, HTTP-based requests are being delivered from CloudFront. Uh, what about streaming? So for RTMP streaming, CloudFront supports all these different uh, Adobe Real-Time Message Protocols from RTMP to RTMPT, RTMPE, RTMPTE. So all these are supported in CloudFront. You can configure it when you configure your distribution. For HTTP streaming, uh, starting with live streaming. So uh, for live streaming, obviously, you're going to be running a streaming server on EC2. And all the things that we talked about in our processing uh, security piece really apply to uh, your live streaming piece because really it's an EC2 instance that is, say, running uh, Adobe Media Server or IIS or Wowza, whatever have you. And uh, it, it will require that, that you set up the security groups properly in terms of the source and port. Um, you can put your streaming server inside of a VPC. Um, and you can, uh, additionally, what you can do is you can also secure the, the underlying content chunks and manifest files. So since those chunks or manifest files uh, are going to be delivered, you know, however you deliver it, either via CloudFront or directly from the server, uh, you can actually secure those the same via the same features or controls that we talked about in the CloudFront security piece. And then you can sign the URLs that are provided by CloudFront. For on-demand streaming, since your content is living in S3, so all the S3 best practices hold there, so you will be creating the S3 um, uh, content security, and then you enable the CloudFront private content feature. So in addition to storage, you know, streaming, uh, processing, a lot of customers ask me, what about you know, other processing needs? Say, for example, geo uh, uh, restricting access based on geolocation. Well, there are many third-party tools um, you know, that come into play in the form of, say, either SaaS-based solutions or uh, marketplace Amazon machine images that really let you spin up the sort of uh, applications really quickly to create this sort of custom uh, workflow, if you will, in a secure way. So here, I just wanted to throw out this example out there for um, you know, geolocation-based uh, restrict, uh, access restriction. So imagine in the case where, say, multiple users are trying to access your uh, content uh, via the cloud front from multiple different locations in the world, and you want to block access. So one thing is, well, it's private content. Great, I am in any part of the world. I can uh, request the content. I have the right signature and everything, and it's good to go. But what if I want to restrict it? So since CloudFront is, with using CloudFront, you are actually very close or there with the flexible infrastructure of EC2 that you can bring to bear. And you can really run uh, an EC2 web server instance or instances that get the first request. And then based on the request, talk to a third party geolocation service like Digital Element or MaxMind uh, to do, evaluate the IP address itself. And then once it's all good, generate a URL at that point for your private content in uh, CloudFront. And then that URL is then sent to the underlying user, which can then go and access the content at that point. Great, so this is what a decorated, secure, simplif simplified media workflow looks like. As you can see, in many different areas, we've put like from ingest to uh, storage, to uh, processing, to delivery, there are many different features that are in play. And those features are really the controls that these underlying services provide you to, uh, to, to really uh, you know, make your media workflows secure and in guidelines with the, uh, in, 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 in terms of the guidelines from the MPA as well. So lastly, auditing. Um, so first of all, we talked about S3 access logs. We talked about CloudFront access logs. Um, you can also set up application level logs uh, in the EC2, on the EC2 instances. So you know, anytime somebody is trying to access your application on EC2, you can log it, put it on S3. There are several third-party products like Splunk Storm, Paper Trail App, 
Sumo Logic, uh, Cloudstat, and Logly. Many of them are here, actually, so I recommend you guys checking out the booth, um, that actually provide you not just log management, but integrate very nicely with EMR, our Elastic MapReduce service, to actually analyze those logs. And then finally, if there is an actual security event that you're facing, uh, or you need logs uh, or forensics for, say, the underlying API calls or anything like that, talk to us. Don't be shy. Just you know, um, contact AWS support. If you have access to your account manager, talk to them, and be more than happy to provide any sort of help or you know, if you need logs, access logs, et cetera, all that access. Great. So from an, M from, from an MPA best practices compliant perspective, we talked about the physical infrastructure security being handled by AWS, already um, audited by code to be in compliance with the best practices. You have access to the guest operating system and the applications on top that you run. And with the help of AWS features that we discussed, like IAM, EC2 security, VPC, S3, CloudFront, et cetera, you can build a really secure model. So once you have these best practices in place, then comes the audit. Then you can work with one of our partners like Code to really audit your application environment or just the application layer and map it back to the best practice guidance that MPA uh, provides. And with that, I would like to introduce Heidi Kajava from Code, our partner, who helped us uh, with the audit for our security controls and MPA best practices. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Usman. Go ahead. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're having a great time in Vegas. This is a great conference. Um, just wanted to give you, you know, some background about some of the things that we did. Um, you know, Usman's been talking to us about how to leverage AWS services to actually help to continue to evolve and secure media workflows. The technology capabilities that he discussed today, coupled with the MPA best practices uh, compliance achievement that they recently accomplished, is critically important to the industry. Um, let's face it, content is king, right? And the owners of invested content, as I like to call it, actually, that's the content that requires significant amounts of, of money to produce. Um, you know, they care about what you're going to do with their content. You know, it's, it's very, they want to make sure that you're prepared to handle, securely handle that content. And, you know, just like the payment card industry wants to make sure that you know how to handle payment card or credit card information and credit card holder information. And just like how HIPAA wants to make sure that you guys are able to handle patient records, you know, the same principles apply here. And one thing that's really important to recognize is that if the industry that you're trying to do business in has a security standard, it's really beneficial to adopt it, okay? So let's kind of break this out into a different perspective. Here's our production crew. Uh, here's a very simplified uh, content creation life cycle. In the days of film, things happened relatively serially. They had to because film was a beast to work with, right? Uh, there was a very limited skill set that could process it. There were only a couple companies that could process the film negative. Uh, the equipment was extremely expensive and it was very heavy. Today, thanks to technology and innovation, things ha look like, more like this. Uh, the processes are much more iterative. Um, there's many more people involved. The, the, the way that we make a movie is faster. Um, it's, it's a pretty interesting uh, shift when you think about the actual transformation of a 100-pound film canister to these bits and bytes that can fit in your pocket or a backpack. And I think I even saw a couple Merses out there in the, uh, in the audience. You know, this is the thing that scares the crap out of the studios. Let's just face it, they can't visualize where their content is anymore. Um, and this is, the one, this is the one area that embracing the MPA best practices for content security, it helps brings that, bring that visibility back to them. You're speaking their language when you adopt that standard, and it's very, very important and it's a huge benefit. So kind of going deeper into the, into the life cycle, let's talk a little bit about deliverables. And here's some examples of some of the things that come out of some of the stages within the content creation life cycle. And I'm not gonna dive into each of these, and I'm sure that there are some of you who are actually building applications who handle or process some of these deliverables, or even potentially 
uh, addressing and streamlining some of the sub workflows that are addressed with some of these deliverables, leveraging cloud technology. Um, again, and embracing the standard right up front in the architecture, when you're de designing the architecture for these applications, is extremely beneficial because it, A, helps to reduce the amount of potential rework that you need to do, but more importantly, you helped, it helps to solidify your security posture with the MPAA and the member studios right out of the gate. And those are some of the services that we provide and ensure that we help you do that. I'm going to steal Usman's slide here um, because I think it's really important. The great thing that they did, AWS has already aligned their services to the standard, which is fantastic for you guys because it gets you more than halfway there, right? Usman talked a little bit about that. Um, it, so each of these services, actually, it's important to notice that each of these services and some of the ones that Usman already spoke to you about, AWS Import Export, and some of the other ones, actually speak directly to some of the, address some of the security controls that are in the standard themselves. And leveraging the stuff that we do, our consulting services and our compliance services, we show you how to plug those things together to ensure that you guys continue to be, maintain that compliance across the stack. The MPA standard was actually built to provide a guideline. And, you know, we come from the studio. Um, we've sat at the table with the creatives and the studio executives and even some of the top chief security officers within the industry, the people who actually wrote the standard. And we know what they're looking for. We know how to interpret the controls. Um, and it's a really, you know, the standard is something that is, it's a critical piece of it. It's a critical piece of all of it. Um, every single thing, you know, some people come up to me and they say, Heidi, I've read the standard and it actually doesn't apply to my business. And I'm here today to tell you that every single one of these 49 control groups 100% apply to your business. If your service or product is touching media and entertainment-based content, it applies to your business. It doesn't matter how much or how little of the content. It doesn't matter where you are in the process within that content creation life cycle, they do apply to you. And we help you understand how and why. So like I said, you know, some of the things that we bring to the table um, is not only our expertise in this area, but our partnerships with the key people that make up this ecosystem. We have, a very, we have direct contact with some of the very, this very, very targeted market. Like I said, we sat at the table with the people who wrote the standards, so we help to eliminate the guessing game when it comes to compliance. Um, a lot of people try to interpret the standards on their own, and we know, how to, we know how to present the information in a way that is easily adoptable to the people who are consuming the information. More importantly, we're committed to getting you compliant. We take a very consultative approach to working with you. And you know, our vendor rating system, which you'll see here, embraces everything, regardless of you're a company of two or a company of 26,000. We don't really care. If you touch the content, we want to make sure that you understand how this standard applies to you. Um, one of the things that's really important to note is Usman said a couple of times that AWS you know, recently partnered with us to become compliant with the MPAA. And it's notable because even though they operate in a shared accountability model, the depth and breadth of the services that they provide to this industry specifically They've actually obtained that merit on their own, which I think is a huge accomplishment. So kudos to you, to you guys. And I will turn it over to you, Usman. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Heidi. All right, so a very quick recap here. So as we talked about shared responsibility model, all the heavy lifting for infrastructure security handled by AWS. That means that we're taking the heavy burden off that infrastructure security away from you. And you can focus on your application security with the help of the feature set that we have built on these services and we enable you to really control how you secure it. In addition to that, the operating system above, everything is what you control and you use the feature set to secure it. In addition to that, you can use things like encryption, OS hardening, OS level patching, et cetera, that make it a valuable proposition or secure proposition at the end of the day. Other resources, uh, please check out the AWS Security Center. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are a couple of really nice white papers that talk about 
the deep down control of AWS security. Uh, also check out documentation on CloudFront security, S3 security, EC2 security, uh, and I, uh, AWS identity and access management. Thank you very much for your time, and we really appreciate your feedback. If you could take some time to fill out the survey, we really appreciate it. And Heidi and myself will stick out here for a few minutes. If you have any questions, we'll take offline. Thank you very much. Thank you.